This is going to be verse by verse of the book of Galatians. So Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And we're going to see some things in Galatians chapter 1 about Paul's apostleship and about his preaching. No doubt about it, Paul is a true apostle and the definition of what a Bible preacher should be. In this study, going verse by verse through Galatians, we will see some characteristics of Paul. And the first thing we see is Paul is a God-called apostle. Paul says in Titus 1.3 that the preaching of the word was committed to him according to the commandment of God. He was a God-called apostle. By Paul saying he is an apostle of men or by men, he is letting the Galatians know he is the real deal and not just another mother sent preacher or apostle. Paul is both an apostle and a preacher. There is a difference between the two. An apostle is someone who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ and witnessed Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. Acts 1 22 through 23 says, Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, talking about Jesus, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. There aren't any apostles today. Nobody today was a witness of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry or his death, burial, and resurrection. Today we have preachers and teachers and pastors. The Bible doesn't teach that we have apostolic succession. We weren't around during what took place when Jesus was here. But next we see that Paul was a preacher of the resurrection. Galatians 1.1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. You can't be a Christian if you don't believe in the resurrection. That is a fundamental of the faith. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then you are a Bible denier. The resurrection isn't like believing in the gap, or believing in a flat earth, or believing any other doctrine that guys get mad about but it's really not that big a deal the resurrection is a big deal and many times the bible makes mention of the resurrection of jesus christ in acts 13 29 through 31 it says and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher but god raised him from the dead and when he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses unto the people. So God is said to have raised him from the dead. Acts 13.30 Acts 17.31 Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You have to believe in the resurrection to be saved. Ephesians 1, 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You see, it is a very plain and clear doctrine. The Bible plainly says, raised him from the dead, over and over again. So Paul was a preacher of the resurrection. Paul was a God-called preacher, and he preached the resurrection. And next we see that Paul was not a lone ranger. Galatians 1-2 says, And all the brethren which are with me, 
unto the churches of Galatia. Notice he said, all the brethren which are with me. Paul believed he had brethren. He believed there was other men saved besides himself. Unlike many preachers today who give you the feeling that they are the only born again person on earth and you have to come to them and come to them only. Not only this, but Paul having brethren, having brethren with him, proves he didn't break fellowship with every person over minor disagreements. Most of these guys today don't have any friends because they done broke fellowship with them because they disagreed about something. If you break fellowship over every little thing, then you won't have any brethren with you at all. So, Galatians 1, 2, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So you see this letter is to all the local assemblies of believers in Galatia. He wants the churches in Galatia to grow as Christians. So another characteristic we see about Paul is that he cared for other Christians. Galatians 1, 3 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is wishing grace and peace towards others. I'm sure there were men in the churches of Galatia who he disagreed with on doctrine, yet he is still wanting them to have a daily growth of grace and daily peace from God. And the daily growth of grace and peace comes through Bible reading and prayer and doing God's service. So Paul was saying, grace be to you and peace from God the Father. Recently, a preacher got up and said, or told another preacher to go to hell from behind the pulpit. And they're praying for men to die and go to hell now. And that's not what Paul taught. He's not praying for men to go to hell. He even says he wished him, his own self accursed if his people would get saved. He wasn't praying for people to go to hell. He wasn't hoping that sodomites go to hell. He wasn't getting getting up preaching and saying a certain preacher should go to hell because he doesn't agree with him. He's saying, grace be to you and peace from God the Father. I know that's towards other Christians, but most of these guys are as mean towards other Christians as they would be towards Charles Darwin or some other atheist. But uh, Galatians 1, 3 through 4. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins and this separates Jesus Christ from all the other satanic false gods. Jesus gave himself while well, all the other gods want you to give yourself or sacrifice your children to them. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us. And no doubt about it, a characteristic of Paul is that he is a preacher of the death, burial, and resurrection. Paul tells you that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. Jesus Christ didn't have to come down in the flesh and suffer for us, but he did it because he loved us. And Paul preaches many times how that Jesus Christ gave himself. If you see Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. First Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Second Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We should follow Jesus Christ's example and sacrifice ourselves for others. You probably won't get the chance to die for someone, but you can choose others over yourself every day. And the Bible says Jesus laid down His life for us. John 10, 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, 
because I lay down my life that I might take it again. John fifteen thirteen. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Since he gave himself for our sins, and we believed on him as our crucified, buried, and risen Savior, we are therefore delivered from this present evil world. We are not of this world, and we are going to be raptured out of this world one day. And every day we should live a separated life from this present evil world. But he hasn't just delivered us from this world. We are also delivered out of temptations. 2 Peter 2.9 Delivered from every evil work. 2 Timothy 4.18 Will be delivered from our wretched body. Romans 7.24 Delivered from so great a death. 2 Corinthians 1.10 Delivered from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Delivered from fear. Hebrews 2.15 and delivered from the power of darkness. Colossians 1.13 I'm glad we are delivered from this present evil world. You know why the world is evil? Because the Bible says the men in the world are evil. And our hearts are evil. The God of this world, which is Satan, is also evil. We can't make the world a better place. It won't get any better until Jesus Christ comes back to take it over. Galatians 1 4 who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you see that Paul is an apostle and a preacher who wanted God to get the glory. He says to whom be glory forever and ever. Many should take note of this and practice it. But he moves on in Galatians 1 6. And says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So we see that Paul is a defender of the gospel, the gospel that was revealed to him. And Paul is amazed how some of them have turned away from the true gospel. The true gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, which says that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And men were going around deceiving others with another gospel, which is not another. There is one true gospel for us today and no other. The men who pervert the gospel today add works to the simple gospel one way or another. Even though Romans 4, 5, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Titus 3, 5, and plenty of verses say we aren't saved by works. Men still want to add water baptism to salvation. And many other things, just like the unbelieving Jews wanted to add circumcision. The book of Galatians was written to teach eternal security and to teach that we aren't saved by works. These guys who are preaching this false gospel are said to be accursed. And not said to be accursed just once, but twice. Paul quotes himself for emphasis in the next verse. And says, even if an angel comes to you and preaches another gospel, that angel is accursed. I wouldn't doubt that Joseph Smith really did have an angel come preach to him a gospel. But it was an angel led by Satan. And there is an angel that preaches another gospel in the Bible in Revelation 14.6. If you turn to Revelation chapter 14 and look at verses 6 and 7. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. 
this isn't the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 that this angel is preaching here in Revelation 14. But yet the angel isn't accursed because he is doing it in the right dispensation. And dispensation doesn't mean period of time. It refers to God dispensing something. God has always given grace to man. Even in the Old Testament, Noah found grace. People under the law had grace. But how he dispensed the grace was different. The non-dispensationalists will lie and say, those dispensational guys don't believe there was grace in the Old Testament. But we do believe there was. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, God dispenses his grace different than he does now. And that's what Revelation 14, 6, and 7 are referring to. Everyone that gets saved is saved by grace. But how they get the grace is different. Today we are saved by grace through faith. Uh, God is giving us salvation. He's get, through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Galatians 1, 10 says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You can see here that Paul isn't a man pleaser. He will not compromise the word of God or the gospel to please men. You know why men want to compromise the gospel? Because they are people pleasers. They want to please people so the people will give them more money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Prosperity preachers will preach a false gospel because they want money. They are gospel perverts, as the verses say. Another mention of the word pervert in the Bible. In Acts 13.10 it says, And said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And one of the greatest characteristics of Paul was that he was a God pleaser and a man displeaser. Paul was put in trust with the gospel and he is going to please God rather than to please men. In 1 Thessalonians 2 4 it says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Uh, God's not going to put Paul in trust with the gospel if he's going to be a perverter of the gospel. He said if he pleased men, then he wouldn't be the servant of Christ. He was an apostle and preacher who knew he was nothing more than a servant. He didn't act like a big shot preacher like a lot of them do now. And just like Jude and James stated in their epistles, he calls himself a servant. And Galatians 1.11 says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. What certifies the gospel for us today is the King James Bible. But since Paul was an apostle, and for a lot of his ministry he had the sign gifts, he could give someone a prayer cloth or raise someone from the dead and confirm, he could confirm the word with signs. But when the Jews rejected the Messiah for the last time, Paul switched to the Gentiles and the sign gift ceased because the Jews are the ones who require a sign. And that is why Paul left Timothy sick. He could have healed Timothy, but he, he obviously didn't have the healing power no more because he switched from Jew to Gentile. The Jews don't, or the Gentiles don't require a sign. If he still had the sign gifts, then why didn't he heal Timothy? And since the gospel has been revealed now for quite some time, me and you learn about the gospel from the Bible and men who preach the Bible. Paul didn't get the gospel from another man like us. He got it directly from God himself. The gospel was revealed to Paul. In Romans 2.16, it 
He refers to it as my gospel. 2 Timothy 2.8 says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. 1 Timothy 1.11, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And then Romans 16, 25 and 26, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but, is, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. You see, it had been kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest. And Galatians 1.12 says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't get the gospel and all the mysteries that he revealed to us from other men. He got it straight from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 2 through 5 says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, which is given me to you, and that's not a time period called the grace of God. This says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, that's God dispensing grace. And verse 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You see, the prophets didn't understand what they were writing when they prophesied about the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't a bit more saved looking forward to the cross then I am saved by getting water baptized. And 1 Peter chapter 1, 9 through 12 says this, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now look at this in verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, which with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. You see how these verses plainly teach the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection wasn't revealed to them, but it is now revealed to us. And Galatians 1.13 says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So now we're going to see that Paul's past didn't keep him from pressing on and going forward. He didn't look at his, back at his past and get discouraged from doing God's work and going forward with it. The conversation he's referring to isn't just the way he talked, but also the way he lived. Paul's name wasn't always Paul, it was Saul. And he persecuted the Christians before he was saved. And this shows that God will save any man, and he'll use any man. He persecuted the church of God. And this verse proves that there were Christians before Paul. How could Paul persecute the church of God if there weren't Christians? The Christians before Paul were in the body of Christ, but they didn't know it because the body of Christ is one of the mysteries revealed to Paul. And this verse disproves hyperdispensationalism, which teaches the body of Christ started with Paul. If Paul persecuted the church of God, then he was 
persecu persecuting the body of Christ. And Galatians 1.14 says, And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of their traditions of my fathers. So Paul was a Jew and wished himself accursed if he could get the Jews saved. But when it came to the Jews' religion, he distanced himself from it. He knew the Jews' religion was a works-based system that would have led him to hell if he stayed in it. He was exceedingly zealous when it came to tradition, back when he was a Pharisee. And just like the rest of the Pharisees, they cared more about tradition than they did the Bible. And if you search the word tradition, you will see many times it is in a very negative light. Matthew 15, 3 says, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Matthew 15, 6, And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Mark 7, 9, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Colossians 2, 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 1 Peter 1.18 For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Bad tradition in the Bible is any tradition that goes against the word of God and makes it of none effect. Even today Christians will override the Bible with tradition. Even Baptists will teach Baptist tradition over the Bible. Galatians 1.15 But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Paul was separated from his mother's womb, it says. And God said about Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Galatians 1.16 says, To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. The heathen is referring to Gentiles. So we see that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Romans 15, 16 says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul is our apostle. And that is why that if another verse seems to go against what Paul wrote, then you take what Paul wrote over that verse. The Bible doesn't have contradictions. It's that you, you have to rightly divide. And books like Matthew and Hebrews have things that apply to someone else doctrinally. And Paul's epistles are doctrine for the church age. This doesn't mean Hebrews, James, and non-Pauline epistles don't contain doctrine for the church age. Because there are some doctrine for us in those as well. And you know, when a verse is for you, is if the verse doesn't contradict what Paul said. We're not hyper-dispensationalists. Hyper-dispensationalists will only claim the Pauline epistles and claim that we can't get nothing out of Hebrews and James and the other ones. But Galatians 1.16 says. To reveal his son in me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Meaning he didn't. Get his knowledge from men. In Galatians 1.17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem. To them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. And I returned again into Damascus. He went into Arabia. And that is where you find at Mount Sinai. That is where Moses talked to God and where Jesus Christ went. And where Elijah went. And God dealt with them supernaturally. And Paul went to Mount Sinai and he got dealt with supernaturally because he got revelations from God directly. And that is where we got the New Testament doctrine and all the mysteries. Galatians 1.18 says, And after three years I went up to Jerusalem... To see Peter 
and abode with him fifteen days. So Paul went and hung out with Peter for a little over two weeks, and during this time Peter could have told him all the stories about walking and talking with Jesus Christ. Probably told him all kinds of stuff that we don't even have in the Bible. Some stories that would have happened. And Galatians 1.19 says, But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So he also talked to James, the Lord's brother. And I doubt they talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary is just another sinner like us, and she isn't a virgin, as the Catholics teach. Jesus was born of a virgin, but after that Mary had other kids, and that's how Jesus had a brother named James. And Galatians 1.20 says, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Back then a man's word meant a lot more than it does now. If a man today says, I'm not lying, you really can't take him at his word. But Galatians 1, 21 and 22 says, And afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face into the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. And it may be a good thing he was unknown by face, because he persecuted Christians in time past. And Galatians 1, 23 and 24 says, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Uh, Paul's turnaround would be a bigger turnaround than someone like Marilyn Manson getting saved, joining a Bible-believing fellowship, and defending the King James Bible, which he once ripped in pieces at his concerts. Paul was against Christians. He persecuted them. And people saw him as a destroyer. Of the faith. Acts 9 19 through 21. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. Paul knew that since he persecuted the church of God, that he didn't deserve to be called an apostle. And 1 Corinthians 15, 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul switched teams to join the winning side. And what we learn from Galatians chapter 1 is that Paul is a true apostle called by God himself and given revelations from God directly that he hadn't even revealed to the other apostles. But this has been Galatians chapter 1.